Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Father, I pray that prayer for all of us, that we might find everything well if we are well in your presence. May we not be distracted today as we come to you to worship. And may, may we find peace in knowing <coughs> that you have saved us. Father, I do ask that as you give us the privilege and me the privilege to speak your word, that I speak your word alone. And I ask, Father, that your people would be touched by your message and be obedient to your prodding. For Father, obedience is the pinnacle of what worship is all about. So help us to be obedient to your word. In Jesus' name, Amen. Today's message is, is entitled To Do What Is Right, To Do What Is Just. And we're looking at Genesis chapter 18, verse 16 to 33, and that's the start of the story on Sodom and Gomorrah. You know, if I ask you, what is right? What's the right thing to do? What's the wrong thing to do? What's a just thing to do? <clears throat> a lot of us, if we're normal people, we would experience situation in life or in, we need to make a decision. Is this decision we're about to make just? Is the decision that we're make, about to make right? Now the problem with this question is this. A lot of people has their own opinion on what is just and what is right, what is proper. You know, um, in the Muslim countries, many just there are arranged. And if the women, woman or the wife falls around, it is right and it is just for the family of the woman to kill their daughter. To them, that's acceptable. Because the daughter brought shame to the family. And, it'll, and, 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 and the family will take it upon themselves to kill the daughter. For us, man, that's crazy. That's taboo. Why would I kill my own daughter? But in their culture, in their society, in their tradition, that's right. In fact, that's a proper thing to do. In our culture, in our context, the policeman right now, to them, killing people is right. It's just. And their commander-in-chief says so. And encourages that. No wonder uh, extrajudicial killing is really up. <laughs> and the police doesn't find anything wrong with what they're doing. It was right, it was just in their sight. In other countries, abortion is legal. <coughs> Murdering children are legal. In other countries, Marijuana is allowed. Prostitution is legal and uh, acceptable. So what's just and right for me might be different from what is just and right for you. Even among, even among Christian discussion, there's a situation. What is the right thing to do? What is the just thing to do? And they quarrel because of different opinions, because of different disposition and inclination in life. But at the end of the day, it is God. God should determine what is right and what is wrong. And we are to conform to the examples and standard that God gives. 
today our message is what is right and what is just until 7 o'clock a.m. this morning I was still grappling with the passage in fact until 12 15 last night I was uh, I, I was still grappling with the passage and until this morning when I woke up I was grappling and grappling and grappling with the passage because I was telling my wife you know honey the passage is it lacks something. I'm not getting it. Around 7.20, I felt I got it. And I felt this is the message of God. On this, you're familiar, right, with Sodom and Gomorrah. And we'll be reading that passage. In the first part of Genesis chapter 18, we saw Abraham having three guests. One of them, God himself and the two angels. And th there, Abraham prepared a feast. Not just plain food, but really a big feast. And they discuss about Sarah. How Sarah would have a child. And how Sarah laughed. How Sarah could not believe. I've heard this story before. I've heard this for the past 15 years and... Man, it was Hagar, not me, that will bear the, the child. But God affirmed, no, it's Sarah. You will bear the child. After that discussion, like any good host, Abraham walked them off. Like us, if we have guests, right? We walk them off to the door. If you can't do it, I tell my kids, oh kids, take your tita to the car or to the elevator, to wherever that might be. Right? That's the right thing to do. And here we, we pick up in verse 16. <coughs> Genesis 18, <coughs> verse 16 says, Then the men rose up from there and looked down towards Sodom. And Abraham was walking with them to send them off. They just had a full meal. God. <laughs> with the angels having a meal with Abraham. How awesome is that? Right? But the thing there is this. God and, and the two angels noticed something. It says, Then the men rose up and looked down. So, something got their attention. The word look down is... They were focused on something. And that something Abraham noticed was Sodom. And, and the three men were discussing. And, and, and Abraham was there just walking with them. <laughs> going to the door of the house. Verse 17. Then the Lord said, and the Lord was not talking to Abraham here. He was talking to the two guys that he was with and to himself. Shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? Really, that statement is not a question, but it's really a statement. God was setting the stage to teach something to Abraham. God wanted to teach Abraham what is right and what is a just decision. And my desire is after this message, we will know how to decide what is just and what is right. And obviously with that question, shall I hide from, from Abraham what I'm about to do? The first answer there is no. We will not hide from Abraham what we are about to do. Now, the question is this. <coughs> Why was it important? Why was it important for God to show to Abraham what he was about to do? Right? Para que? For what reason? Verse 18 tells us the reasons. 
since or because Abraham will surely become a great and mighty nation and in him all nations of the earth will be blessed. You know why? Because Abraham will be a great and mighty nation and the whole earth will be blessed by it. Now you ask, so what's the connection? What's the connection of God showing Abraham that he's about to destruct and will destruct Sodom and him saying it's because he will be a great nation? What's the connection there? And the connection there is this. If Abraham would be the father of a great and mighty nation, Abraham has to understand and emulate how God thinks and how God acts in order to lead the nation according to the sign of God. And God says, come here, Abraham. Learn from me. My kids, my desire is I came from a rough time at work since 19, 2014. <clears throat> one, of the, one of my big desires at that time, and by God's grace, I'm over the hump of that crisis. Only really by God's grace. But one of the things I keep telling my wife and my kids, how I wish you were with me in the office. To see how I was able to think to work through and hopefully you would learn from me how I did it the attitude that was required the thinking that was necessary the sacrifice that I had to do so that one day when you experience a similar challenge in your life you would have learned from me and, and for God to teach Abraham how to be just and right as he leads a great and mighty nation which will be a blessing to the whole world he has to expose him on the ways on the manner on how God works that's why he said Shall I, is there a need and the answer there yes there is a need for God to reveal to Abraham this. Sabi nga sa verse 18, right? Since because Abraham will surely become a great nation and a mighty nation and in him all nations on earth will be blessed, 19. For what reason? For I have chosen him. It is not because Abraham would be a great nation not because of his own efforts. Not because he was righteous. Not because he was good. He would become a great and mighty nation because I have chosen him. It is not because of what Abraham has done. It is because of what God has done. That's why he would become a father of a great nation. For I have chosen him for what purpose? What was the purpose of God for choosing Abraham and making him a great nation? So that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the ways of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice. You, Abraham, you have to be just and right. I've chosen you to show the world how God is just and how God is right. And I'm about to show you and explain to you what being just and right is all about. Not based on the standards that you have been exposed to, not based on the opinions of your friends, but based on my definition of what is right and what is just. With the privilege 
of being chosen by God, there is a responsibility. There is a responsibility being a child of God. The fact that salvation is free does not mean that we are free to do anything that we want. Does that, it does not mean that we are free from our responsibility. And one of the responsibility of Abraham was to ensure that he will be able to teach his children what is just and what is right. So it says there, For I have chosen Abraham so that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the ways of the world of the Lord the word ways of the Lord there means what to have a lifestyle for that lifestyle to conform to the prescription of who God is God expects his people to have a lifestyle of what justice a lifestyle of doing what is right. That is the reason why you are chosen. Question. Is our behavior such? Are we reflecting that lifestyle of being just? That lifestyle of being righteous? It is only through exposing to God's way would Abraham be able to learn what is right and just and lead the nation towards the way of the Lord. Up to this point, Abraham had no idea <coughs> what God was about to reveal. He had no idea that the point of discussion would be about Sodom and Gomorrah. But because of the purpose of God, He will now reveal it to him. Though he was not talking to Abraham yet, God was still talking to the two angels. And the Lord said in verse 20, The outcry of Sodom and Gomorrah is indeed great. And their sin is exceedingly grave. You know, if God is a God of righteousness, and if God is the God of justice, He cannot let things go unpunished. A just judge will not let the guilty free. Because he is a just God, he will let ensure that the wicked will be punished. And what we see here is this. God is not ignorant of the wickedness that is happening around the world. He was not ignorant of on the wickedness that was happening in Sodom and Gomorrah. God sees all the offenses that is happening around us, even if you don't see it. Do you think that the, do you think that God does not see the extortion and bribery that's happening in the government? Do you think that God does not see all the Killings that is happening in the back streets of our cities? Do you think that God does not see the millions of kids that are being murdered? Do you think that God does not see the drug syndicate raking their money at the expense of the youth? Do you think that God does not see how men would exploit women through prostitution? 
God sees all things. God saw every offense done by every person in Sodom and Gomorrah. Go to Hebrews chapter 4, please. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 13 says, And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Nothing is hidden from God, including your sins. Don't ever think that God does not see and know all of your sin. Visible and invisible. And as Proverbs chapter 121 says, Assuredly, the evil man will not go unpunished. The evil man will not go unpunished. God sees all crimes done against him. And he takes offense. We may be unaware of the injustices, but no one wrong has ever gone unnoticed by God. Not one sin done by any human in all eternity is unnoticed by God. No thoughts of yours which is hidden in your heart and mind is not known and noticed by God. His eyes is looking down on it. All is laid bare before Him who sits on the throne. Not only does God see the great sin, but God heard the cry. The cry of His people. Like Cain, right? Cain and Abel, what did God say in Genesis chapter 4? What have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. In James chapter 5, verse 4, the wages you failed to pay the workmen who mowed your field are crying out against me. God hears our cry, our pleadings, our difficulty. <coughs> and the sins here in Sodom was so great and was so grievous. God heard it. And God will take action. God cannot be indifferent to the sin that are committed in the outcry of the oppressed if God is a righteous and just God. A righteous and just God will take that into consideration. Verse 21. God says, I will go down now and see if, there, if they have done entirely according to our outcry, which has come to me, and if not, I will know. What did God say? Okay, I've heard, I, I've, I've heard the complaints. I heard the, I heard the accusation. Let me validate. Now, bear in mind, it's not that as if God does not know. He's just saying this to show to man, to show to Abraham, to show to us that he's a just God, that he will not give a decision, he will not give a verdict without first verifying. Somebody comes to me and says, Dad, um, Santino did this and that, did, did that. I will not say, Santino, get the bell. No, 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 no. I will verify. I will check. I will investigate. I will probably call Bettina. Bettina, were you there when this happened? Okay, Santino, what's your, what's your story about this? 
And God said, I will go down. Let me check. Not that I don't know, huh? but let me check to show you that I am a just God, that I will not make decision capriciously, that I will look down and thoroughly investigate the crime that I've been hearing, the outcries, the sins that's being accused. That's why all judgment of God is just. No one is in hell there unjustly. Everyone that is in hell is justly in hell. And there is no punishment meted out to anyone that is unjust. By examining the situation, the Lord was acting justly. The magnitude of their iniquity was probably known throughout all the region because Sodom at that time was a prominent place. There were a lot of social injustice according to Ezekiel. That the people there were wealthy but they were depriving food to the poor. They were not helping the needy. All through this time, Abraham was listening. Abraham heard the conversation of God and the angels. And Abraham knew the implication because he knew who God is, that he was a just and righteous God. And he knew also deep in his heart that the accusation of God is true. He knew Sodom and Gomorrah was guilty. And he knew that God was just. And because of that, he will not let this go unpunished. But on the other hand, he also knows that there is a remnant there. At the very least, his nephew Lot. And because of that, verse 22, that the men turned away from there and went towards Sodom. And God said, okay, go. Investigate. They come back to me. If the report is true, if what the, 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 the letters and the emails and the text messages that I've been getting is really true. Alone with God, while Abraham was still standing before the Lord. God said, proceed with the investigation. While the angels left, the word there, Abraham was still standing before the Lord, has an imagery of Abraham standing before the bar of justice. And there in front of a court wherein God is a judge, he, Abraham, now is in front of the judge about to make a plea. As Sodom and Gomorrah was languishing in their sin, little did they know that the man of God was in the mountain with God interceding in their behalf. They had no idea. They don't even care. Maybe some of them doesn't even know about Abraham. But God was there, uh, Abraham was there pleading to God. Verse 23. Abraham came near and said, Will you indeed sweep away the righteous and the wicked? Alone in the court, standing before the judge, Abraham approached the bench and says, Judge, will you indeed sweep the righteous with the wicked? Psalm 75 verse 7 says, God is the judge. Abraham knew even before the, the, the result of the investigation of the angels came back, he knew the outcome of what that investigation will bring. 
That's why, kumbaga, inuunahan na niya si God. <laughs> there was still no report, right? No validation, but he said, Lord, will you wipe away both the wicked and the just together in Sodom? Nowhere does, do we see Abraham refuting the, the statement of God. Nowhere do we see in the passage Abraham going to Sodom and asking them to repent. Instead, Abraham turns to God and asks Him for divine mercy, for divine justice, and for divine righteousness. And the question is, will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Is, is, is the future of the righteous determined by the wicked? Lord, why is that? Why will the, why will the righteous be equally punished with the wicked? Wala mo masamang ginawa si righteous. It's the argument of Abraham. Verse 34. Now he makes his case. He builds up his case before God. Lord, in front of the bench, suppose there are 50. 50 righteous within the city. Will you indeed sweep away and not spare, spare the place for the sake of the 50 righteous who are in it? At that time, a city, to be called a city, you need 100 people. Minimum. You can be 200, you can be 1,000, you can be whatever number you want. But the minimum is 100. I know in the Philippines, diba? You need a certain population to be a town, to be a city, to be a municipality. During the time, to be a city, minimum 100. Abraham said, Lord, paano kung 50-50? Half is good and half is bad. It's what he's asking. Will you wipe them out? 50-50 and Lord, huh? it's 50-50. Verse 25. Abraham answered for God. Far be it from you to do <coughs> such a thing. Lord, I know you. You will know, you will not do that, right? To slay the righteous with the wicked so that the righteous and the wicked are treated alike? I know you, you'll not do that. Far be it from you. It's beside me to think that you would do such a thing. That you would slay the wicked and the righteous 50-50 together. Shall not the judge of all the earth deal justly? God, you're just. Would you not do it justly? During the time the Israel judges are expected to, to acquit the righteous and condemn the wicked. And if this is the standards of the human institution and human judges, shall not the judge of all the earth act justly? If God expects Abraham to lead the nations rightly and justly, right? You, God, has to show the example. How can you behave differently? Because you know in our Jewish law, the, the righteous is acquitted and the, just, uh, the righteous is acquitted and the wicked is condemned. The idea of sweeping away the righteous along the with the wicked is 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 a is parang unfair, right? But if you think of it, it is unjust, right? If you if you uh, sweep away both the righteous and the wicked together because of the sin of the wicked, it's unfair. It's unfair to the righteous. But if you do not sweep away 
the the unrighteous it is unfair to the wicked because they are being treated as if they were righteous both cases unfair we only think that it's unfair because the righteous is is punished like the wicked but we don't see that if God does not punish then it was unright it's unjust because the wicked is being treated like the just and we know that God is just that is the argument that Abraham is trying to present to God verse 26 so Abraham said if I find in Sodom 50 righteous within the city uh, and the Lord said if I find in Sodom 50 righteous within the city then I will spare the whole place on their account I will spare 50 50 okay I will not wipe out Sodom and Gomorrah for 50-50. Why? On account of the righteous. Hmm. That is just. That is right. This gives Sodom and Gomorrah time to repent still Exodus chapter 34 verse 6 and 7 and others read it then the Lord passed by in front of him and proclaimed the Lord the Lord God compassionate and gracious slow to anger and abounding, abounding in loving kindness and truth who keeps loving kindness for thousand who forgives iniquity transgression and sin yet he will not by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquities of the fathers, of the children, and on the grandchildren, of the third and fourth generation. God will give people time to repent. Verse 27. Abraham replied, Okay, God, I get the point. Now behold, I have ventured to speak to the Lord, although I am but dust and ashes. Uh, the patriarch admits that his situation right now before the judge is precarious. In fact, it could be considered out of line. How dare you talk to God? But Abraham knows his place before God and he comes to him in a humble manner, saying, Lord, I am but dust in ashes Abraham is not demanding Abraham is not claiming that he knows better than God and he's just saying God um, this, is this is the situation I'm not saying that I know better than you because I'm just but dust and ash what a great attitude <coughs> sometimes when we talk to God we don't have that attitude we have the attitude of arrogance of right of being privileged that God is required to to answer my prayers and do what what I bid him to do but God but Abraham the presence of Ab of God realized no no I'm but dust and ashes and I'm just here pleading pleading to you and he continues pumasasa 50 Suppose that 50 righteous are lacking 5. 45. Will you destroy the whole city because of 5? And he said, I will not destroy it if I find 45 there. God said, okay. Abraham said, okay. 29. He spoke to him yet again and said, Suppose 40 are there. And God said, I will not do it on account of the 40. Hmm. Not bad. Try ko pa. Then he said, Oh my Lord, not be angry. Shall I speak? Suppose there are 
30 are found there. And he said, I will not do it if I find <coughs> 30 there. <sighs> oh, one more time. And he said, now behold, I have ventured to speak to the Lord. Suppose 20 na lang, Lord. 20 are found there. And he said, I will not destroy it on account of 20. Wow, the whole region is in sin. And God said, on account of 20, I will not. On account of 20. Woo. One more time. Then he said, oh my Lord, not be angry. Shall I speak on this once? Suppose 10. 10 are found there. And he said, I will not destroy it on account of of them. Ha! And soon after he finished speaking to Abraham, the Lord departed and Abraham returned to his place. For the sake of God's people, blessings are given to the utterly undeserving. Judgment is averted. Otherwise, it has been. Otherwise, they would have perished. Laban was blessed because of Jacob. Potiphar was blessed because of Joseph. And the question I ask myself is this, am I a blessing to the world that's around me? Let your light shine before a man that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Are people being blessed? Is the wrath of God being spared to your neighbors on account of you? Or are you like Romans chapter 3? These people blaspheme the name of the Lord because of you. There was a remnant in Sodom. And because of that, the wrath of God was being held back. And they were experiencing the blessings of God because of the believers there. Are the people around me, my helpers, my drivers, my friends, are they experiencing the blessings of God because of me? Because of my life? And I realized something. A just and righteous God will favor the just and righteous. God is inclined to favor His people. Abraham's concern is, God, which will affect more the destiny of Sodom? That's the question. Which will affect more the outcome of what will happen to Sodom? Is it the many? Sabi ko nga, the bare minimum of the people in Sodom is 100. Kasi city siya. But it could have been easily 1,000 because they were prominent. But even at 100, 10, Abraham, if 10, will the destiny of Sodom be determined by the numerous wickedness that is prevalent in Sodom? Or is it determined by the few who are innocent? Typically, we'll say, no, no, no. It's majority wins. 90%. It's wicked, then no. Sama sama sila. But here we see the answer is different. God says it is not the majority that wins, it is the innocent. It is because, on account of them, God fixes his eyes on his people. The people of God is special to God. 
Not only are they important, but it is the mean that the entire community was preserved. Apart from those people, the remnant that was in Sodom, the whole Sodom would be annihilated immediately. As much as the nation of the earth was blessed through Abraham, the guilty Sodom and Gomorrah find mercy in the lives of these remnant people. It gave them a reprieve for the guilt that they have to give them time to repent. Now the question I ask myself is, how will this teaching of Sodom and Gomorrah affect the way I live? How does this help me become more righteous and just? That is the question. Because this discussion is not a debate. It's not a negotiation. I always viewed this before. Ah, Abraham was negotiating with God. But no. This is not about negotiation. This is about explaining to Abraham what does it mean to be a just and a righteous God? It, it, it's trying to show us what it means to be a just and a righteous believer. And as God would focus his eyes towards a city that, that has sinned greatly against him. Because God focuses his eyes on Sodom. And the sin that, has, that, that, that was done greatly against him. We too, we tend to focus on the person that has sinned greatly against us. But because God is a righteous and just God, He chooses not to look at the majority wickedness that was done to Him. But He chooses to look at the remnant. And we should not... And we, sh we cannot and should not question that. Do you think that God was righteous and not looking at the sin of the majority? When I was grappling with this, I go, Lord, Lord, parang that is not right. Parang that is not just. You know what God told me? What right are you to tell me what is right and just? That is your standards. Let me tell you, Bobby, what is just and right. Just and right is looking at the remnant. And because of that, you would act accordingly. I was so uncomfortable. But that's what God said. On account of them, on account of the few, not of the many that are wicked, that this blessing of reprieve is given to them. If you advise that somebody to somebody that's even, that is not right, you consented, you blah, 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 blah. But again, God was teaching Abraham, Abraham, you would be a great nation. You need to be just. You need to teach justice and righteousness. Let me show you what that is. It's not looking at their sins. It's looking at their goodness. And as much as God looked at the remnant, His chosen elect, not at the wickedness done against him, we are to do the very same thing. Not to make a decision based on the wickedness done to us, but based on the good that's being shown to us. Wow. We might not have a Sodom and Gomorrah town that has gone, did some offense against us, but we might have a Sodom person that has offended us. And we choose to look at his sin or her sin and not the goodness in him. Because God wants us 
to look the goodness in Him and use that as an opportunity to minister to that person in order that they may be saved. That is just. That is right. In 1 Corinthians 7 verse 14, for the unbeliever husband is sanctified through his wife. And the unbelieving wife is sanctified through her believing husband. Please go to 1 Peter chapter 2. First Peter chapter 2 verse 12 says, Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles, unbelievers, so that in the things in which they slander you as evildoer, in the things that they have done against you, they may, because of your good deeds, as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. Let the evil done to us be an opportunity for us to minister to them. But we will never be able to minister to them if we look at the wickedness of Sodom. We have to look at the remnant in Sodom. So that by ministering to them, they may observe your good deeds and glorify God in a day of visitation. Bobby, that's not just. Bobby, that's not right. And I'll say, I agree. But that's the standards of God. Not my standards. I'm not the boss. Again, the point of the passage is not about how to negotiate with God. But what is right, what is just in the eyes of God. Will the judge of the earth do what's right? That's the question of Abraham in verse 25. Will the judge of the earth do what's right? And answer this, yes. I will do what's right. I will not punish the wicked because of the remnant. I will overlook that because my eyes are strained on the people that I love. We believers, we are the descendants of Abraham. Will we do what is right to those who have sinned against us? And God said, I will not destroy them on account. I will not destroy it on account of them. My desire for us is this, that we may realign our value system that we may see that the just, that we have a just and righteous God. But we may adjust that definition of what it means to be just and righteous. And what it means to be just and righteous is focusing on what is just and right in the situation. And using that as a tool to minister to the lost. Thus says the Lord.